Hello and welcome. I'm Lee Peterson, host of the podcast WD Cast, which is called WD Cast because it's brought to you by WD Partners, whose tagline is innovation at scale, which means that WD has services that range from strategy, design, digital operations that, that we're going to talk about today to architecture and construction management. So end-to-end services, wdpartners.com. And thanks, WD, for making this whole thing happen. Appreciate it. And um, a second about the mission of this show. On WDCast, our goal is to talk about the burning issues of the day. It doesn't necessarily care like if it's retail or whatever it is, but we mm-hmm. want to talk about everything that's going on out there that's that's pretty much on fire, which is a lot of things mm-hmm. right now. And um, we've got a special guest uh, that has to solve what I personally would consider to be one of the most daunting category issues of the day, that is retail and restaurant operations. And for me, at a high level, the reason I say that is because of the pressure that e-commerce and then the the new consumer has put Mm -hmm. on operations, you know, like something like buy online, pick up in store, uh, you know, customer tracking. Are they here to pick something up? Delivery, all of that. Uh, Delivery. Yeah. On and on and on. You think about it. And we found out through our own studies like six years ago that buy online, pick up in store was a really big thing for consumers. Mm -hmm. Now you tell a retailer, somebody may be as massive as Target. Okay, customers want to come and pick it up, and they're in, they have inline stores. They don't have an area for it. They don't have pickers. Right. They don't even know how to hire pickers. Right. They, you know, they don't know how to pull the merchandise. They don't know when a customer's coming. On and on, all that is operations. Yep, it's our sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know what yeah. I'm talking about because you yeah. went through it, and we're yeah. going to get into this. Absolutely. Um, so. Uh, I would just like to introduce our guest here, and uh, and she's going to help us understand these challenges and solutions for them, hopefully. Her name is Joanne Hayab. I got that right? Yep. The uh, SVP of operations at WD Partners. She is based right here in the middle of retail, uh, Columbus, Ohio. So, hey, Joanne. Thanks hey, for thanks, Lee, us. for having me. Yeah, it's good to, good to have you on board. Yeah. Um, could you take a second and just give us a little background, like where you came from? Full disclosure, uh, Joanne and I work for the same company, but at, like, way different, different times. times. yeah. <laughs> we, I think we had, we were, uh, and that is ex- lim- Express, which was Limited Express when, mm-hmm. when I was working on it, mm-hmm. and... We had five stores that were in the back of limited stores. I think when you worked in there, there was probably 800 stores. Yeah, and yeah You were sure. really kicking butt, yep. I think, at the time. Yep. Um, I do have to give a little disclaimer before we get going, which I just remembered. The thoughts and opinions expressed today, even the one about kicking butt, uh, <laughs> belong to the members of this discussion, do not necessarily represent those of the companies that they work for, which in this case is the same company, okay. WD Partners. Yep. But anyway, could you go back and give us a little bit of the history, like, uh, you know, where are you from? What, how'd you get involved in, yeah. in this conundrum of, yeah. of operations? Yeah, you know, so I grew up um, the daughter of a restaurant operator. So my whole life was really, you know, around a restaurant and how watching my dad do all of that stuff, you know, getting people through the line, drive throughs all of those things. So I got into retail, honestly, because it was better hours than restaurants. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, they actually closed. Yeah, they actually closed. So, um, you know, I started, um, you know, my retail journey. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and started my retail journey there and then progressed into the Ohio market, um, working for Express originally. And, you know, I started at, you know, kind of an associate level. So retail's in my blood. I've done every role, you know, possible up through head of stores, um, you know, for companies just to be able to, you know, I love it and and understand the nuances that go into both customer facing and behind the scenes, you know, work that the employees have to do. 
So, you know, I was brought here to, you know, the, the retail mecca of Columbus um, through our former company, you know, um, through the L Brands umbrella um, to get into operations and to really figure out how to help, you know, a fleet of stores, you know, really increase their, their growth and their profit, but through operations, like through smarter stores, through smarter schedules and really start to implement, um, you know, some of these newer things that the consumers were doing, um, you know, continued my journey, you know, around to other different retailers and started to get into buy online, pick up in store, ship from store. What did that mean to the the stores? Because they weren't built that way. You know, right, most right. retail stores right. were built, you know, they were lucky if they got a, a, a remodel or a refresh, but the back rooms pretty much stayed the same of, you know, kind of warehousing space. So starting to think differently about that and, and how, you know, the back room needed to change, but also the operating procedures needed to change as well. So that's what really drew me into operations because, you know, every day is something different. It's a huge puzzle for me to figure out. And, you know, it's that those things that kind of keep me going every day. So you think that, um, you know, your background in a restaurant with your dad and that mm-hmm. type of thing, mm-hmm. think that affected the way that you think? Yeah, and for sure. You could see like what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And then that applies to just about everything. Yeah, you know, I mean, it made me understand, like, how to get ready for a peak, you know, how to get ready post-peak for the next peak that was going to happen, you know, from lunch to dinner. Um, it also was, you know, the customer service piece. And, you know, like, if everything's yeah. going right, customers are happy, you know, and if they're not, the last person they're going to tell is the hostess on the way out the door. And sometimes that was me, and I didn't want to be in that position. So, um, you know, learning, you know, kind of the front of house in a restaurant, but then also being back in the kitchen and seeing just like the science that goes on back there and, and you know, getting all those orders ready and pulled. And, you know, so that was kind of fascinating for me, you know, and then when I got into retail, I was able to think about all the things that applied you know, that I had learned, you know, working in restaurants. So, um, so it was, it was an easy progression for me to kind of understand the speed and urgency, you know, to get people through the line at the cash wrap, get product back out to the floor so you could make sales. So, um, you know, for me, it was an easy, you know, transition into operations to be able to understand what all that was going to look like. And how do you schedule to it? Because, you know, before I didn't think about like, how's the labor going to be used every day? What kind of equipment needs to be done? (laughs) So, you know, those were the things that I started to really, you know, kind of dive deep into in the operations, you know, field. And we have a lot in common, which we've talked about before because we work together. Yeah, yeah. But um, I started in stores as well. Mm -hmm. And I thought it, and and I don't know if you found this to be true, but it it was interesting through the course of operations Mm -hmm. that some people that you work with just get it and yeah. then other people don't. Like, you mm-hmm. know, uh, we used to say that uh, whenever you hear this whole th- the whole uh, conversation about this would be a great job if it wasn't for the customers, then you knew that yeah. you had an employee <laughs> issue. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you find those people that just love, you know, the operations piece and, and love the fact that it helps the, you know, the customer experience is, is really what it's all about. So yeah. Yeah. you got to love both the customer side and understand what you're doing adds value. So... Could you give us a little bit of a, a like a day in the life? Yeah. Joanne's day in the life at WD Partner. So what what is it that that you're actually doing here? Yeah, I mean, every again, every day is something different. But, you know, typically, you know, it's it's engaging with our clients, understanding, you know, what maybe their needs are on a daily basis around, um, you know, where we're in, in progress for, you know, a, a job that we're working on for them. But it's a lot of, you know, looking at data, understanding kind of the financial modeling of um, companies so that we can truly produce um, a great system for throughput, flow, all of those things. So when we're looking at lay, laying out a back room or laying out a kitchen or, you mm-hmm. know, thinking about a grocery and understanding BOPUS, all those things, that's what we do on a daily basis is, is we are, I would say, troubleshooting problem solvers <laughs> every day. And um, it's a lot of collaboration. You know, even though we're ops, we work with, you know, our insights team. We work with the strategy team. We work with the A&E team, um, our environments designers. Like we are embedded in, I think, probably every piece of the business at WD versus being very siloed and just being Which, ops. which totally makes sense. I mean, yeah. that's the way you think about a store or a mm-hmm. restaurant is yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, it's for all sure. connected. Yep. Right? Yep. And so, um, 
you know, every, like you said, uh, we designed basically the stores and the restaurants that we have now 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And the idea was when we designed them, and I was part of this as well, we're going to make a thousand of these. Yep. You know, because they're doing, <laughs> we, we opened, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them, and they're so great, we're going to make a thousand, we would cookie cut them. Mm -hmm. And now, like, what do you do when somebody comes to you and says, okay, now we've got these stores that are designed for one thing, which is stack it high and let it fly. Mm -hmm. And now we need buy online, pick up, and store. Like, what's the, what's the first thing you do? Buy online, pick up, and store. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, the first thing is, is getting an understanding of their space. And getting an understand of the customer journey, you know, and and really what what is it they want to accomplish? Is it, you know, I'm going to bring it out to your car? Am I going to leave it a locker here? You know, do I need to figure out? Is it, you know, they're going to be a different service desk for it? You know, but really trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish. But then it goes straight into the operations. You know, most companies just bolt on, you know, a buy online, pick up and store space, whether it's, you know, a nook in the front of the store that was unproductive or they cram it in the back room for yeah. a bunch of employees yeah. to like try to pick and pack. And it. yeah. And, you know, and then you're, you've got, you know, pickers and packers walking down aisles trying to figure out stuff, the same thing. So, you know, we try to, you know, solve a lot of that. So the first thing is understanding their floor plan and how do we best optimize the space so that it's as least disruptive to their normal day-to-day -day operations, but that we make it really, really efficient, um, you know, in the back of house. Because, you know, we want to get the flow through the units per hour that they're picking and, and, you know, getting out there for customers. You've got time deliveries, you know, these people that have somebody coming in 20 minutes to pick up their groceries and, you know, you've got to hit that. So there's, there's a lot of pressure, you know, on the stores, but we really go in and, and do a full assessment of kind of what's the actual physical space so then we can start to help them streamline their processes. But there's some, there's also some things that are just going to be more costly. Yeah. Right? Yep. Like pickers. Yep. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, you need pickers. And and uh, has, there, has there been like a transition? I, I feel like I've noticed that at mm -hmm. places like Whole Foods where at first the pickers were employees. Mm -hmm. Like you thought you could make your store employees just pull these orders. Yep. And then the orders got to be so numerous. The next thing you know, there's all kinds of people wandering around with, you know, vests on just mm -hmm. doing that. Isn't it going to be more expensive? Yeah, yeah. You know, you think about the labor that goes into that, you know, yeah. and you're, you're looking for, you know, someone that's a little bit more specialized that can do those quick throughputs and just, you know, pound out units in a, in a cart and be really accurate. I mean, that's the most important thing when people are you know, doing buy online, pick up in stores. You don't want to go home with someone else's, you know, groceries or, you know, whatever you picked up at whatever store. So, yeah, I mean, the the labor, you know, the, the persons might cost a little bit more, but the labor model definitely shifts, you know, on how you're going to deploy those people in within your schedules. And then it impacts your replenishment, the hours you've dedicated for replenishment in stores because, you think about it now, like if you, you think about Whole Foods and you've got a, a one group that is going through and picking, you've got your employees that are servicing customers. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got your employees that still have to go back and stock the shelves, right. you know, from all the things that your pickers stockers. picked off. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got your stockers, your pickers, your employees. So it's really added kind of this third layer of replenishment. And, you know, when I think about where we need to go in the industry is really about thinking differently about how you leverage your back room, not as just warehouse space, but as productive space you can really leverage those pickers where they're not interrupted with, you know, customers. They might have, you know, your top skews back there that they can really kind of crank through. But I think there's, you know, there's got to be a change because this isn't going away. It's yeah. only going to continue to increase. And I was reading an article about, you know, millennials are the number one, you know, consumers of buy online, pick up in store, especially in grocery. So, you know, when you think about that and, you know, they're going to continue to, you know, be really powerful. And, you know, the next generation after that, like, what are they going to want? So I think a lot of people need to start thinking even more forward out. And then hopefully the sales make up for yeah, it. Right? Yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. Like this, this past holiday, I guess, buy online, pick up in store was off the charts. Yeah. And especially the week before Christmas because yeah. you can just, um, oh, my God, I've got to go pick that thing yeah. up. So you just drive over there and you pick it up. Mm -hmm. But And so undoubtedly, at least for December, it probably balanced off. Right. But at first, I mean, it's a, an expense. It, in kind of an odd way, it reminds me of uh, 
Remember after 9-11, mm-hmm. how all the airports had to change? And yeah. Then there was, everything was backed up because, of, yeah. you know, security got screwed up. We didn't, mm-hmm. there was no TSA, I don't yeah. think, at the time. <laughs> yeah, none, none Nothing, everything got backed up. For and, sure. but, but everything changed. And now it's kind of like, you know, yeah. uh, if you see any new airport designs, especially some of them that I've been through in, in Asia, it's mm-hmm. all smooth sailing, sailing. through yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So you see that same kind of transition. Yeah, I think it's, it's a learning curve, right? You know, and anything that changes or is different, you know, I mean, you think about, you know, you go somewhere and they've they've remodeled their store, they've put things in different spots. It takes the consumer a little bit of time to figure that out, you know, but when you throw buy online, pick up in store, it becomes completely disruptive, you yeah. know, for the operations because now you're like, how how do I do it all? How do I hit the times? How do I get units back out on the floor? Who gets credit for the sale? How do I make sure, you know, I'm not duplicating efforts, right? So in retail, I get packages in, I unbox them, I hang them up, I censor them, I put them on the sales floor just for somebody five minutes later to be like, oh, we got an order for that. So now I'm going to unhang it, uncensor it, put it back in a bag and ship it out in the box. Probably (laughs) a better way to do it. Yeah, maybe in the same day. So, you know, there's, I think, you know, when you think about, you know, how we process merchandise, how we get stuff ready, some of the technology that can start to go into, you know, back rooms that really help them. Make it more like a fulfillment center. Make a fulfillment center. It becomes more efficient. You know, it's a little bit more costly up front. But on the back end, the labor and the efficiencies that you gain are are tremendous. And then there's delivery. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Like I said, uh, there there was an article that came out, uh, you know, right after Thanksgiving that Target um, fulfilled 80% of all their online orders from their stores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they would obviously you had to like turn their back rooms into fulfillment centers where they were getting an online order that was somewhere within their zip code. Mm-hmm. They'd pack it up and yep. ship it there. Uh, eventually, do you think they're going to have to have vehicles that move out there? Like like Home Depot does that now. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. mean, but they're going to construction sites, so it's a little, a little bit easier than yeah. not going to everybody's house. Yeah. You know, I yep. think, I think, you know, the home delivery is, is something that is going to continue to, I think, grow legs. Um, you know, in the industry. And, you know, I think about, you know, we've already seen, you know, Walmart start to bring groceries right into your home and put them away on your shelf. You know, so if we're not thinking about how do you use the inventory that's in stores to offset the online demand, you know, if traffic is, is going down in stores, you know, and, and that's, you know, yeah. Trend, has re, been. Yeah, has yeah. been. It continues to go down yeah. and down, you know, but there's all that inventory still sitting out there. So you still have product that if you don't start doing buy online, pick up in store or ship from store or leveraging your stores as fulfillment centers, you're sitting on inventory that's never going to turn. And, you know, fast fashion, you know, if it's not gone in those first, you know, two to four weeks, it's going on a red line and you're already going to take a hit on your margin. So, those are the things that, you know, as you think about leveraging your product differently, because you know this from your retail days, product and payroll are your two <laughs> biggest expenses, yeah. you know, for, for anybody. So if you've got product out there and you're not leveraging a way to get it into the consumer's hands before you take a hit on it or in food waste or pitching it out, um, there's a lot of, of opportunity there. So. And you just did a presentation in New York City at, at uh, Google's headquarters. Yeah. I know that because I was in the audience. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. You know, um, the topic was online to offline. And so, you know, Google really has done their job in exposing and getting people discovered online, right? So you know where companies are, you know what products they have. They've gone so much as to be able to even go down to what inventory is available in a store today. So, you know, what we really focused on is what does that mean when they go offline to brick and mortar? And, you know, really about the execution of the stores is what becomes critical because now you're under a microscope even more. You've got traffic flowing in from, you know, your online that's driving traffic there. You've got your regular consumers still walking in the door. But, you know, overall, it's about, you know, the execution. What do you do around merchandise availability? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, experience when they get there, right? So if they're coming to your store, they want something. 
you know, what they want more than just to pick up their groceries or, you know, to, you know, go pick up a sweater. It's, it's about the experience when they get there. And it's still, they want friendly associates, they want speed and efficiency at the cash wrap, um, you know, and if they're booking an appointment, you know, think about the ways that, you know, consumers are having different experiences. Like, you know, you can go to dinner at Restoration Hardware. You know, you can work out at Lululemon. You know, there's things like that that are providing, you know, the holistic brand experience within those four walls. So yeah, you can listen to records at Urban Outfitters. Yeah, exactly. yeah. You know, so so what we talked about was really, you know, what does that mean for the store once the traffic is there and how do they fulfill the brand promise of driving that traffic? Um, because once they leave, they go right back online yeah. <laughs> and they tell the world <laughs> about their experience, right? Yeah. They can rate you. Um, so it, it really becomes, you know, the stores become so important at that point to be able to deliver with the, the online promise. It seems to me too, and, and this is where the disclaimer comes in, but uh, there was a little hesitation to move to things like that because they're expensive at first, like mm-hmm. buy online, pick up a store and delivery and that type of mm-hmm. thing. And uh, during that period of time, say five or six years, when you know retailers and restaurateurs were moving to that mm-hmm. uh, with reluctance, yeah, Amazon exploded. Basically, mm-hmm. I mean, they threw Prime on on top of the fire, and yeah. the next thing you know, it's two hundred ninety billion dollars a year. Right. Um, so I, th- I think I don't know if you agree with me, but the, there was a lesson learned there. Mm-hmm. Like, if whatever that customer wants, they want to do by online pick up store. Let's figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, you can't wait anymore because there's so many choices out there. So if you're not doing it or you're not doing it well, they're going right. to go somewhere else, you know, and they're, and in, charge. they're, the they're boss. in charge. They're the boss, you know, <laughs> it's like they've got the money in their pocket and, and they can vote for you or they can choose not to. And, you know, I think people are reluctant. I think, you know, in the restaurant and the retail business when, you know, delivery exploded and Bopus exploded is, you know, there's a cost associated with it to get the technology, to really be able to understand, you know, when somebody is going to be sure. there and, pickers. you know, pickers, you know, all yeah. those things, you know, like, are you going to invest? Yeah. Are you going to invest in mobile devices for mm-hmm. every single person to be able to do that? That's not cheap across however many stores you have. So, you know, where are you willing to budget that? And, you know, a lot of times that's not where you want to put your money right away because you're a little hesitant. Is it going to work? How are we going to operationalize it? Versus saying, you know, we're just going to go for it. We're going to learn as we go. We're going to, you know, reiterate what works and we're going to, you know, trash what doesn't work and, um, you know, test and learn. And I think that's where Amazon boomed when everyone got a little bit concerned about, is this really a thing? Yeah, and I think, you know, in my mind, Walmart did one of the smartest things ever. And people forget about this, but it was about four or five years ago where the CEO got in front of Wall Street and said, uh, you know, we're not going to make the same amount of money we have been before because for the next couple of years, we're going to reinvest in the company for exactly things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now, as you can see, like Walmart's way ahead of the curve on, yeah. on all of that. Yeah. The buy online, pick up and store. They have the, the best, I think, buy yeah. online, pick up and yeah, store. Yeah, I mean, right they're now. definitely an emulator. Like they are the ones everyone's chasing. Everyone wants to figure out what are they doing? What's the speed? How did they do it? You know, what are they doing with their pickers to make them more efficient? How are they? And they've even gone so far as to start thinking differently about how they stock their shelves uh-huh. within the space that makes it easier for the pickers. Like a warehouse. Like or, a warehouse yeah. to get product out there that, you know, the consumer doesn't really even notice. But, you know, doing those small tweaks on the shelves and the marketing on the on the shelf line are, are some really cool things that they're doing that, you know, I think others could, you know, really learn from. So from some of these boxes and, and even the specialty retail, where do you see what do you see the end game? You know, is this are they gonna be three quarters fulfillment centers and one quarter showroom stores, which is just, you know, scan and ship the house? Yeah. Or what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean I think I think there's a, a unique way to kind of look at it, right? So you gotta look at, you know, the thousand store chain isn't necessary anymore, you know, yeah. for that, True you know, that. yeah, you know, it's, there's just not the need Hundred. for it, Hun- you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, how do you become, you know, more profitable with the real estate you have and start to look at leveraging things within a market, you know, specialty retailers often have 
a lot of stores in, in, in metropolitan markets. You know, there's not just one of that store in town. So it's thinking differently. Like, could one be the fulfillment center? One could be, you know, one that you take all of your, um, you know, online returns and, and start to think about, you know, more of a um, discount model, you mm. know, because a discount business in retail is, is doing very well. It's thriving yeah. where, you know, specialty is, is, you know, kind of just the drug of discount right now and, and everyone waiting for it to go on sale. Right. And then I think, you know, the showroom is, is definitely an option because you don't have to hold inventory. You can focus truly on the customer service and services, you know, like alterations, embroidery, like all of those things that can, you know, really give you that differentiation in the market. Um, I think it's about going back and looking at, you know, where do you have these large spaces that you could start to crank out inventory and, and just do ship from store, do buy online pickup in store and, and, you know, take return online returns back and get them processed quicker because you don't have all the distractions of, I've got to ring it through the register and I've got to, you know, but you also want to make a, uh, another sale and, you know, the single cart methodology within a POS system, not everybody has. So you got to do all these transactions, then you're using more labor. So yeah, I think there's specialty needs to really undergo kind of a, yeah. Evolution. Yeah. And, and and I think part of that, too, is the gathering space itself, yeah. the malls itself. Like, people yeah. aren't visiting malls as much as they were yeah. before. You know, 40 years ago, a mall was a brand new thing, and now it's not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, just to mention, too, uh, Joanne and I will be at retail or restaurant spaces mm -hmm. March 3rd or March 2nd and 3rd in Pasadena, California, talking about this exact yeah. topic, as a matter yeah. of fact. And we have some solutions that we're going to show as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, I don't think we can have a conversation in retail today without mentioning, you know, what we call the 900 pound gorilla. Yeah. Right. The, which is Amazon. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously like uh, companies like Walmart are, are competing better. I mean, they're doing, uh, doing great, mm -hmm. but Amazon has really kind of bored a giant hole in the center of retail. Yeah. And if you were somewhere in the middle there, you weren't a discounter or you weren't like what we call third wave, you know, somebody brand new with some excellent ideas or, you know, like Dyson's doing showroom stores, really, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. I, how do you think, you know, what's the best way to compete with these guys, you think? Yeah. You know, I think it's getting smarter with where you place your stores and what experiences you're going to do. Because Amazon can't offer the experience that an in-store environment can, right? They offer you speed, consistency, um, and right to your doorstep. But if there's still a lot of people that want to experience things. So not just experience walking into a store and seeing a table full of folded sweaters and denim. Like, that's not the experience I'm talking about. But, you know, what's going to make people want to come there? You know, is it an event? Is there, yeah. you know, f a lot of, you know, places are offering food. You know, you think yeah. like a neighborhood goods and, you know, um, companies like that that are really starting to think about their space and what they can offer, you know, the consumer kind of like that soup to nuts of, of what's going to make them different. And Amazon can't do that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think we have a white paper about that. Now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, yeah. One of the examples I always like to think of, and it's a, a small scale, but it's a it's a good emulator, is Rafa. Yeah. So R Rafa has uh, what they call clubs. Mm -hmm. And so people gather there, but they gather there to cycle. It doesn't matter that you're a Rafa person or not. You mm -hmm. gather there to actually go cycling with people. But if you go into one of their clubs, and I've been in a few of them, I mean, it's really kind of about... Yeah, they sell some merchandise, but they also have espresso and, you know, food yeah. and, like, tables to hang out mm -hmm. at. And, oh, by the way, a $300 jersey over yeah. here. <laughs> you right. know, th that kind of thing. But it's about they're actually using their stores as, uh, like, sort of brand advocates. Yeah. More yeah. than anything else, that the physical store itself yeah. becomes something completely different. Yeah, I mean, different. I think that's that's what's going to be, right? Like, that's going to differentiate them. Like, you can go anywhere and buy, you know, a bike jersey. You could get on Amazon and get a bike jersey. But, yeah. you know, to go there and you feel part of the brand, you know, and you feel like you can experience what those people are experiencing that you see in the advertisement or online, bringing that into the physical space is is what makes you feel good about going there and you know sipping your coffee and checking out your jersey and I know you, you probably walk out with a couple of them cuz you love to cycle so. or you know, go <laughs> go home and buy them online yeah. I think you know is the other thing right yeah yeah any any other so we talk we talk about buying online pickup store and delivery 
I uh, mentioned showroom stores. Is there any like hot buttons that, that you see? Anything coming up that yeah. you know, retailers should look for? Yeah, I think, you know, because of, you know, the buy online, pick up in store and delivery, what it's kind of done to disrupt the way the customer shops, right? Mm-hmm. Supply chain. You know, you've got to think about how product now is coming to stores. And, you know, there's a lot going on, you know, in the logistics industry right now um, that is impacting the way product gets to stores. But, you know, a lot of companies need to think differently about how they pack product to go to stores. You know, is it more efficient for them because they want to get it out from a unit perspective out of the warehouses? But then what is it costing now with the buy online, pick up in store, with ship from store? So there's a lot of, you know, exciting things that can be done around the way product is delivered to stores, how it's packaged in the box. Um, You know, when you think about, um, you know, because of the logistics, you know, some people can't take, you know, some restaurants can't take delivery every day. There's not a truck going there every day. So how does that impact your refrigeration in the back of house and all of those things? So supply chain, I think, is is the next big thing to kind of start to think about. I think you're really right. I mean, uh, you know, we talk about the the end result of supply chain, mm-hmm. really, and mm-hmm. that your store becomes a fulfillment center. Mm-hmm. But it's also a store. Yeah. So that's two different things. Before it was only one thing. Right. And now it's two right. different things. Yep. So back that up, and you've got a completely different ball game yeah. for, from warehouse or from manufacturer direct right. or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever whatever it might be. So you think that, that that's kind of the hot button Yeah, because I think, you know, stores are starting to figure the other things out, kind of, you know, but um, – but that's the one thing that slows down the production of pickers, of packers, of delivery even. So, you know, I think that that's something to keep your eye on. Okay, so shifting gears, um, a little more about you. Yeah. Heard that you're like an avid cyclist, indoor yes. cyclist, runner. Yes. Like all that stuff. Is- yeah. Yeah, so I run a... What about this? Yeah, so um, I head up a local running group here in Columbus. Um, You know, we meet a few times a week, and we do some give backs here in the community as well. But, you know, I've been running for a really long time. I won't date myself. Um, But, yeah, so I also teach um, indoor cycling um, here in a studio here in Columbus. That's the first and the oldest cycling studio um, that we had in Columbus. 614? 614, yeah. 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 Um, Shameless plug. I know, shameless plug, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so so I I do that. I'm very active, um, you know, in my other free time. I do a lot of yoga, so. So running, are you any good? I... I am. I think I'm pretty good. I set, you know, I set some good PRs this past year, which was my goal. I, you know, I ran a lot of miles and, um, you know, felt really good. You know, I keep up with some people that are half my age, so I feel I feel pretty good about that when I'm out there running with them. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And that's not easy. I don't no, think. Like, don't it's not. So do you do you do outdoor cycling? Um. You know. Unfortunately, I don't. I'm not real coordinated on a bike. Just if you want, <laughs> want to come with us sometime. I, I would if you wouldn't laugh at me because I'm not. I'm not very coordinated on the bike. Coordinated. Yeah, you know, like, like you fall over. Like the stopping and the unclipping and oh, getting oh, up. The, the yeah, unclipping, yeah. The unclip. Like I'm good on Boom. a. Yeah, I'm yeah. good on a bike that just stays there. <laughs> I can unclip and clip all day, but you know yeah, that that, that, that that part gets me a little. Okay, so how about a bold prediction? For 2020, what, what's going to happen here? Like, what kind of year is this going to be? Wow. A, a, anything. Just yeah, yeah. You know, I think, I think this is going to be the year that retail really, like, revolutionizes itself. Like, I think this is going to be the year because, you know, the last few years has been the retail apocalypse and, you know, everything's closing. I still think we're going to have that so that stores can become profitable. But I think that, you know, this is going to be the year that they really start to think about if I want to have skin in the game, I want to be around, you know, for another 10 years, I've got to reinvent myself. So I think this is going to be the year that they really actually put pen to paper and and start investing. Um, Kind of understand that the reluctance, yeah, reluctance period is over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't. You know, they've held back because you know the traffic's been down. They've held back on investing in stores and investing in, you know, technology. And what's happened? They are just yeah. they're dying, yeah. and they're either going to decide that, yep, I'm good to close my business after all these years, or I'm going to have to really be smart and strategic about the stores I keep open 
so that I have the money to invest in them so that they can really become these experience hubs, be, become, you know, more technology based better in and better and fulfillment, well. more efficient, um, you know, updating POS systems that in some cases have been around forever that, you know, can't do multiple transactions at once. So, yeah, I think this is going to be the year that we're either going to see it happen or we're going to see another downward slide and there's going to be a lot more, you know, stores closing up, which I hope not because, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Speaking of that, like I, I just saw Express's plan for the year yeah. yesterday, and that's a lot about what you're talking about, yeah. I think. More focus on the customer, not as many stores. Mm -hmm. uh, fulfillment, like talking yeah. about how to do fulfillment better. I, I thought it looked to me like a really good... A solid plan. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, at, at this point in time, uh, you know, no longer, I, I, I think, uh, are you going to go, what we're going to do is take Amazon head yeah. on and <laughs> yeah. forget about yeah, it. Yeah, no way. You're going to fail. <laughs> you know, how, about if, how about if you just try to be yourself or yeah. something like kind of totally different? Yeah. Uh, okay. Any, anything else? Um that you want to add before we go to our, our famous lightning round? No, I, th I think we've covered a lot. So, you know, I could talk all day. So Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk more in uh, Pasadena, too. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the idea of this lightning round is I'm going to say one word, two words, and then you're mm -hmm. just going to give me what you think pretty quick about it. Perfect. Okay, um, and some of it's close to home. Okay. Work-life balance? I have it. Love it. Oh my God! It's the first. <laughs> <laughs> it's about being disciplined, like the discipline. Like you gotta, you gotta make time for it. So, you know, between travel and kids, and you know, being life and being able to plan out, you know, workouts and all the exercise and all the other exercise. Like it's it's discipline, man. Like and it, yeah, my family comes first, so I'm always uh, there for them. Uh, favorite city? Chicago. I love Chicago. Really? I do. It's my yeah. hometown. I do. I know, but yeah. like, I didn't say it because of that. But like, I'm I do. Sure. <laughs> you know, I love it. You know, I think there's fun stuff to do in the summer. There's just you know so much history there. Um, the city is a lot of fun. Cubs you know, are there. The yeah. Cubs are there. You know, it's always fun to go watch a game. Yeah. So it, it's it's like a big city, but it feels small. You know, and and that's what I think I like about Chicago. Yeah, I think it, it's it's always a little stunning. Like if you go to L.A. and you go to New York, yeah. and you go to some cities in Europe, London or something like yeah. that, and you go to Chicago, which is a big city, you know, close to five million people and yeah. a lot more than that in the metro area, and everybody's just really nice, They're really nice. friendly. Yeah, you know, and there's and again, like it, there's great places to run along Lakeshore. You know, so it's flat. And it's flat. it's yeah. nice and flat, <laughs> you know, and you don't have to like, you know, dodge all the people when you're running down the streets like you do in New York or L.A. When you're you know, in the city, you've got a, like a place you can kind of get out there, go on the lake and oh, yeah. just go that's, straight. That's a great run. Yeah. There. So uh, last one. You are addicted to. Working out. <laughs> running. Yeah. I, I mean, know the feeling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, running. There's nothing like that runner's high, yeah. you know, that you get. And, and it's kind of my when I think about when I'm thinking you know, when I've got, you know, presentations to do or, you know, I'm trying to work through, like, a process for a client, like, I just go run and somehow it all comes together in my head, so. I, I hear you. I yeah. totally hear you. Plus, yeah. plus, I think there's something also to uh, the clarity of working yeah. out. Like, it, it, a, lot of, a lot of times it's so hard mm -hmm. that your brain clears of all these, like, voices yeah. telling you what you have to do and all the stuff that you have to do. It just clears it all away. And then somehow at the end of that, because you have cleared it out, then you can start over and look at it maybe fresh. Fresh, for sure. For sure. We agree. I agree. Well, Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very oh gosh, much. Thanks for having me. Very, very gracious. Much Absolutely. appreciated. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, you're, in, you're in a hot spot now with this operations thing. A lot to change. Yeah. So people be sure and listen anytime for some more human interaction mm -hmm. like we just had on... Hot topics, which, by the way, you are also welcome to suggest and to email to us anytime. And be sure and subscribe to this podcast. WDCast is at WDPartners.com. Go to the menu hamburger up in the upper right-hand side and hit what we think. Then go to the very bottom of that page, the bottom center, and hit the podcast icon and pick one. And we've got a whole bunch of them in there now. Uh, EY, Google, INS, who, is, uh, who does pop-up stores. We've got the CEO there talking to her. Green Growth Brands, which mm -hmm. is, you know, another Columbus startup company, a cannabis-oriented uh, mm -hmm. company. Uh, we even talked to Alexa one time for the fun of it. And, of course, we've got Joanne Heil. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. And remember, it pays to be alert and stay frosty out there.